this on set. Good morning again to you, Will. Uh, today's top story, U.S. authorities seeking a record fine against the French bank BNP Paribas. That's right. This is a fine that could be more than $10 billion. This to settle criminal charges the bank violated U.S. sanctions with Iran, Sudan, and Cuba. BNP is locked in talks with the U.S. Justice Department, and people close to those talks that the bank hopes to pay less than $8 billion. A deal is likely weeks away, but both figures are far higher than earlier reports. But BNP could absorb the charge without being destabilized. And this process has been underway for some time now, so what's been tying things up? Well, prosecutors have been pressuring the bank to plead guilty to charges, something BNP is wary of because it could endanger its license to operate in the U.S. Now, both sides are also discussing whether BNP will temporarily be denied the right to transfer money into and out of the United States, which is, of course, a key component to any foreign bank's business in the U.S. And uh, how are things looking in the markets today? Well, markets in Asia are following the U.S.'s lead from Thursday. This is after uh, sh investors shrugging off uh, gloomy economic data from the U.S. Uh, there is good news out of Japan, who's been battling deflation. Consumer prices rose at their fastest pace in 23 years after an increase in sales tax from 5 to 8 percent, though the Nikkei trading slightly down today. And we're expecting more investors to be following this economic data. There's been a raft of economic data coming out of Japan in the recent weeks. All right, let's look at this interesting story now. The, uh, the U.S., or at least its commerce chief, said it's time to start new relations with Cuba. That's right. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce has long opposed the embargo as harmful to U.S. business interests. The, its head, Thomas Donahue, made a three-day visit to promote capitalism on the communist island. Donahue said reforms must be accelerated, and it's time for the U.S. and Cuba to turn the page. Yuka Roya has more. Seeking business opportunities in a post-embargo future. The head of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce says it's time his country resumed its ties with Cuba and eased sanctions. For too long, the relationship between our nations has been defined by our differences and shackled by our past. It doesn't have to be that way. It's the highest profile visit of this kind in 15 years. Washington has not had formal diplomatic ties with Havana since 1961, and trade embargoes have remained in place for more than half a century. Cuba buys some U.S. food and agricultural goods under an exception to the sanctions, but has been increasingly turning to other countries. The European Union is now its biggest trading partner. U.S. sales to the island have almost halved in recent years. Accompanied by some top business leaders, Donahue toured newly privatized factories and the port and met with President Raul Castro. His trip was criticized back home by some lawmakers who support the sanctions. Everybody's entitled to their opinion, including the members of the Congress and the Senate. We happen to have a different view. We think this is a very positive um, opportunity. The trip comes as Washington is set to impose a record fine on French bank BNP Paribas for breaking U.S. trade embargoes and doing business with countries, including Cuba. And finally, we take a look at other stories making business headlines. Let's begin with the U.S. car giant Ford, who is recalling 1.4 million vehicles sold in North America. 1.1 million of those are sports, vehicles, sports utility vehicles that could suffer a loss of power steering. While 200,000 Taurus sedans built between 2010 and 2014 could be prone to a corrosion issue. Now, both car makers and U.S. regulators have stepped up efforts recently to recall vehicles as soon as defects are discovered. And they're on a pace this year to break the record for most recalls in a year. Now, workers for the online retail giant Amazon begin a two-day strike in Germany. The local labor union wants Amazon to raise pay for workers in accordance with the mail order and retail industry in Germany. Amazon, however, has rejected the demand. It regards its warehouse staff as logistics workers and says they receive above-average pay by the standards of that industry. And it's a case of too good to be true. The U.S. airline Southwest has been fined for deceptive advertising. The budget airline will pay $200,000 to U.S. regulators. Southwest advertised $59 flights from Atlanta to New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles in October 2013. But the U.S. Department of Transportation said no seats were actually available at that price.
And that rounds up the business news with Will Hildebrandt. Thank you very much. Thanks, Harold. Let's move straight to web news. See what's getting clicks online, beginning with the online campaign to free an American citizen jailed in Egypt. Hundreds of social networkers have been posting under the Free Sultan hashtag, calling for the immediate release of American Egyptian Mohammed Sultan, who has dual nationality and was arrested when he was in Egypt back in August 2013. His crime? Taking part in a peaceful protest supporting ousted President Mohamed Morsi. The online campaigning has intensified following the recent release of a video in which he appeals for help from his cell. He's been on hunger strike since January of this year. The clip, which was posted to the Free Sultan Facebook page this week, was recorded at the beginning of the year, but not released by his loved ones until now. If you're watching this, it means I'm in a hospital bed because the hunger strike I started January 26th, earlier this month, has gotten the better of me, or I'm dead. Alarming words. He also appeals to the American authorities for help. The message has since been widely relayed on social networks, where many have voiced their solidarity with the young prisoner. Mohammed Sultan's supporters have also started an online petition signed by over 7,700 people, calling on Washington to exert pressure on the Egyptian authorities and secure his release. In addition to the numerous online initiatives, activists have also taken to the streets. As we can see here, a number of rallies have been staged in the US over the past few weeks, with demonstrators calling for Mohammed Sultan to be released at the earliest possible opportunity. Pakistani woman Farzana Parveen was stoned to death in Lahore on Tuesday, in public, by family members. Her father has justified their actions with, I killed my daughter as she had insulted all of our family by marrying a man without our consent, and I have no regret over it. The so-called honor killing has sparked strong reactions on social media. Many have taken to Twitter, posting under the Fazana and Fazana Parveen hashtags, condemning what they describe as a barbaric, brutal and heinous crime. She was 25 years old and three months pregnant. Web users are appalled that her own family could do this to her and say they should be given exemplary punishment. Sadly, this isn't an isolated case, as the NGO Aurat reports every year in Pakistan close to a thousand women and teenage girls face the same fate and it seems the numbers are constantly rising. The practice is widely condemned by the international community, but it appears this is not the case in Pakistan itself. A study conducted back in 2009 found that 83% of Pakistanis questioned said they agree with stoning as punishment for adultery or bringing dishonor to the family. And yet a growing number are now taking to the web to denounce this practice. They criticize the authorities for not doing enough to stop it happening and demand justice for every woman who's ever been subjected to stoning in Pakistan. Thousands of American web users have been posting under the Not One More hashtag, urging the US authorities to implement tougher legislation on the sale of firearms. The phrase was inspired by a speech delivered by Richard Martinez at a memorial ceremony for his son, Christopher, who was killed in last week's shooting in Isla Vista. During his address, the father spoke out against the government, saying lawmakers were doing nothing to curb gun violence and prevent these mass murders. We have your phone and we dare you to find us. Two dim-witted thieves sent this message along with a selfie to all the contacts in the teenager's mobile phone they'd just stolen on the streets of New York City. They used an app that allows users to send photos that disappear after a few seconds. But one of the contacts took a screenshot of the photo and forwarded it to the boy's mum, who contacted the police. The pic was then sent to the media and posted online, and of course the culprits were tracked down and arrested, and they'll soon be appearing in court. <laughs> What would the women in some of the most famous masterpieces look like if they were given the Photoshop treatment? Artist Lauren Wade decided to find out. The collection is available to view on the site takepart.com and aims to encourage debate about today's notions of beauty.
Otter loves to go wingsuit flying and he wanted to share his passion with his dog, Whisper. So he wrapped his four-legged friend up safely in a backpack and off they went. You can check out the incredible scenes in this video, available on Vimeo. I know the truth now. I know there's more than that fantasy of like, oh, we'll fly together. There's also, oh, we could die together. What happens when dogs fly? It sure wasn't. All right, we're going to take a short break. When we get back, we'll have a full roundup of world news, of course. And Russia threatening to reignite a gas war. Moscow could cut off delivery to Ukraine, potentially affecting deliveries to Europe as well, if Kiev doesn't pay $3.5 billion in debt immediately. What does this mean for Ukraine and Europe? What's at stake? We'll be putting those questions to Douglas Herbert in just a moment. 